My name is Sandy Baird, as some of you know, um, and I am here for the People's Law School, which is a new project that I'm involved with, creating a People's Law School so that people, poor people in particular, and particularly new Americans can have some access to the courts, and I hope some understanding of what happens in the courts. Um, and also the People's Law School will be presenting these kinds of presentations on Wednesday evening when we'll be talking about the law, politics, and some international relations. And with us tonight is John Murad, the uh, chief of police. I guess you're still the interim or what's the deal, John? But maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. As sure. we begin. Uh, last semester, John did a session called Policing the City because recognizing that that is one of the biggest issues of our country and our city at this time is uh, policing the city as apparently crime rates are rising. We don't know exactly how much they're rising, but that is the, uh, at least the, uh, I guess the temperature of the election. And those people who are talking about rising crime rates are making that a very big election issue. And so the policing the city has become a very contentious issue in our society and in our town. So tonight we wanna to continue that discussion about policing our cities with our chief, John Murad, who was just not reappointed, but I guess continued, is that correct? Well, maybe you can explain a little bit about who you are. John is also a longtime Vermonter, has lived here, was brought up here by his parents, who were part of the Spanish department at UVM for a number of years. And John then is a Vermonter. He went to Harvard, didn't you, John? At yes. Wonders. And now he is our chief and he was appointed by uh, Mayor Weinberger. And then he was kept on, I guess, in the recent <laughs> situation. Is that correct, John? Yeah, that's that's about the that's about the truth of it. I yes, I Hi, my name is John Murad. I am the acting chief of police for the Burlington Police Department. Uh, I was uh, nominated by the mayor, but uh, did not receive a, an approval from the city council. Uh, there was a 6-6 six, six vote down, uh, mostly party lines uh, around that, uh, around approving the mayor's appointment. So I am the appointed but unapproved chief of the police department. I've been the acting chief of police since June of 2020. Uh, prior to that, I was the Deputy Chief of Operations uh, since October of 2018. Prior to that, I worked for two years in the private sector in security work. Uh, and then prior to that, I did 12 years with the New York City Police Department, starting as a police officer and rising through the ranks of detective and sergeant, and ultimately uh, finished as an assistant commissioner uh, of the New York City Police Department. So uh, I did before that, grew up in Vermont. I was born here in Burlington and grew up in Underhill. My parents were professors at the University of Vermont. They're actually on the call right now. Um, I went to MMU and then I went to Harvard. Wait a minute, wait a minute. what's MMU? Mount Mansfield Union High School. Okay. So I went to MMU High School out in Jericho. Uh, and I then uh, moved after Harvard, moved out to California to seek fame and fortune. And you wanted to be a movie star, didn't you, at one point? Yeah, movie star, writer, yeah. uh, something along those lines. Uh -huh. But 9-11 made me uh, realize that, that for me, that life was not a contributory one. I think that you can accomplish amazing things in the arts. But for me, I wanted to do something different. Uh, I moved back to New York City. I worked in publishing for a while at Newsweek Magazine for a while. And then I joined the NYPD after marrying the woman who's now my wife. And, and getting that part of my life in order, uh, I then was able to, to find a career that I really loved. And I do love it. I still love it. And, the, and you loved it in New York City schools. as well? Did you love it I'm, in New York City? I did. I loved yeah. being a cop in New York City. Uh, it was a, a really heady time. And there were a lot of important changes being made in that police department, uh, changes that I was proud of. Uh, we were instrumental. The management team that I was a part of uh, the executive team was instrumental in driving down stop, question, and frisk from highs of around 700,000 in 2011 to around 12,000 by the time I left the department in 2016. Uh, instrumental in, in changing the way that the department interacted with the public. We implemented something called neighborhood policing, 
which was a, a really robust community policing model that required a lot of resources. We actually got the first headcount increase in the New York City Police Department in, in nearly uh, 15 years and used that increase to create a, a model of policing that allowed officers to step away from the radio and not be indentured servants with the 911 system, but instead be able to proactively uh, connect with and reach out to the community and, and get to know people in the neighborhoods they policed. So I was very proud of those kinds of innovations. Uh, it was a tumultuous time in policing to say the least. It's only gotten more tumultuous yeah. since I returned. Uh huh. So, and after you were in New York City, that's when you came back here, correct? I did. After I left the NYPD and worked for two years in the private sector uh, and uh, then missed public service. So I took a I took a 60 percent pay cut and returned to public service and also returned to Vermont, uh, which was which was a key part of that was getting to come home. And you wanted to, correct? Oh, you very much. To return to Vermont, right? Very much. I wanted I very much wanted to return to Vermont. My wife and I, every time we would visit my folks out in Underhill, as we drove down Poker Hill Road and hit Route 15, we would look at each other and say, how do we get back here? What do we do to get a job in this place? But it was challenging. Uh, and so when the opportunity to, to join this police department as a deputy chief came, I leapt at it. Okay, and that was when Del Pozo was the police chief, correct? That's correct. I'm chief Del Pozo hired me as a deputy chief of operations, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to him for that. So did you know him prior to that, prior to you being hired by him? Did you work We had together? never worked together. No. Uh, we had never worked together, but uh, you know, we were both in the New York City Police Department at the same time. We knew one another. Uh, there aren't a lot of police officers with Ivy League educations. Uh, Chief Del Pozo had gone to Dartmouth and then had gotten a master's degree at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I had gone to Harvard, but also had gotten a master's degree at the Kennedy School as well, uh, not at the same time. But we, we crossed paths very often. We knew each other. Uh-huh. So now you're back in New England and you're in Burlington, the Queen City, right? Yep. And when uh, uh, Chief Del Pozo resigned, retired, resigned, correct? Resigned. Um, you became the interim chief, is that right? Or what, I was, what happened? I was briefly the acting chief. Chief Del Pozo left in December of 2019. And I think that many people know that there was a, it wasn't a pleasant departure for him. He had done really wow. great things for the city of Burlington, but he got uh, embroiled in a, a scandal around social media. He right. resigned in December of 2019. I was the acting police chief for about three weeks. And then uh, Chief Jennifer Morrison, who had been a deputy chief in the Burlington Police Department and then had been the chief in Colchester, Colchester right. was brought in as a interim chief, uh, as distinct from an acting chief or a, an appointed chief. But she was the interim chief from January of 2020 through June of 2020. And I took over in June of 2020 when she left. She left the department. Uh, it had been an interim job with a shelf right. life. She knew she was going to leave after six months. There was the possibility that she might return. She chose not to, owing to uh, issues around politics, issues around decisions that were made in June of 2020 around funding. And uh, I have been sitting in that chair since. Okay, so what do you think? Are you enjoying yourself? It is, it's, it's an adventure every day, that I will, mm -hmm. I'll say. Uh, enjoying is, is probably a strong term for it. I, I feel an incredible sense of, of mission. I feel like this so is. So, what is a, it? What is your mission then? My mission is to keep people safe by preventing and responding to crime and disorder with and for my neighbors. That is policing. Policing is keeping people safe by preventing and responding to crime and disorder with and for our neighbors. We have to be able to work with the community. We have to recognize that it's not merely crime, it is not just the kinds of things that we think of when we think of an episode of Law and Order. Or, or, you know, in the old days, an episode of, of Dragnet, it is far more than that, because ultimately policing spends more of its time dealing with disorder or issues around how people are interacting in shared public space than it does with people who have been robbed or feloniously right. assaulted. Mm -hmm. so and that's a good thing. What, what do you mean by disorder exactly? Well, I think disorder is, is brokering public cooperation. There are times where people cannot cooperate in public together. And, and public you're we, talking about, right? You're talking I'm about sorry? public. You're talking about public Correct. disturbances, right? Sure. The yeah. idea of, of using a public space in a way that prevents other people from using it 
and in a way that's not fair or that defies the rules that we've come up with. We've spent more than 2,000 years as a culture recognizing that we that, that ultimately we have to have somebody who speaks on behalf of the state and does so in a very fair way. We're not always great at that fair part. I try very hard to make sure that that is a controlling factor here in Burlington. I think that the Burlington Police Department gets it right far more often than they get it wrong. But we have to do it in a way that is fair and safe for everyone. And we have to make sure that everyone's needs and interests are balanced against everyone else. And sometimes those balances take on you know, interesting turns. Today, there was a very small protest uh, in solidarity with Ukraine. And so people came down the hill from the University of Vermont towards Church Street. And when things like that happen, we have to balance people's rights to express themselves and, and to take advantage of their, their First Amendment right with the right of everyone else in the town to continue to move around if they want or to be able to uh, go up and down a street. And where do those balances come out? A lot of times that's a determination of a police officer or a police supervisor or a police chief, because the law doesn't really distinguish between who's got which right when. Mm -hmm. and so balancing those in ways that are fair, but most importantly, ways that keep everyone safe is really the key. So, so you're the chief, though, when the movement to so-called defund the police happened. Is that correct? That what, is correct. And what happened around that? So, uh, you know, on, on May 25th uh, of 2020, the Burlington Police Department was conducting the largest food distribution that had ever happened in Chittenden County. We were working oh. with the Vermont Food Bank uh -huh. and the National Guard. We shut down 128, the belt, and we distributed food there. And on that same day, March 25th, 2020, in Minneapolis, uh, four men wearing uniforms very similar to the one I wear when I'm in uniform, uh, murdered a man. One of them murdered a man. And the other three stood by and have been held accountable for that now in court. Right. Um, that changed a lot of things. It was a, uh, a dam breaking for a moment of racial reckoning for this community and this city and this county and the state and the country around this, this issue that has never been settled in our, our 400 plus years as uh, of European presence on this continent around racial injustice, around uh, systemic racism that, that is built up around those things. And it burst that summer. And a factor in that burst or an outcome of that burst here in Vermont, in, in Chittenden County and in Burlington, was a pronounced desire to change policing and to reduce policing's footprint in ways that would allow other footprints to increase. Footprints like mental health care, footprints mm -hmm. like social services. and the notion was to take away money from the police and give it to those other entities. And I am in fact pretty, uh, pretty supportive of that idea. What I never was supportive of and I'm not supportive of now was doing that without having those other entities in place. You can't diminish the one entity that does respond to all these things because policing is around, because policing has the shortest phone number in America, just three digits and the here we come because policing is open and operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it always comes. It is the responsive agency to all of these issues. And perhaps it shouldn't be. Perhaps a lot of these things have been loaded on the plate of the police as other social services and systems have been uh, not funded properly over the course of our, mm -hmm. our history. Um, but the police were the ones addressing these issues. Can I, and you can could I not you withdraw it without right. building up those other resources. I'm sorry. Can I, sure. can I just interrupt you for a moment? Because I know I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And let me give you um, why I went down to City Hall numbers of times and asked them not to defund the police. And I'll tell you why, because partially of what you said and part about disorder. The way that um, I'm a lawyer, I've dealt with domestic violence all my life, basically, but as a, an attorney, especially here with the new Americans, I deal primarily with institutions with the fact of domestic violence. And why I was so concerned was that that's where the police have to respond, it seems to me. And I'll tell you why I believe that, that it's not totally proper for a mental health worker or anyone else to be in the situation of, in which domestic violence is occurring because 
that's usually when a cop gets killed, or a lot of times. There was a high degree of violence in those situations against the police. But the second reason is you police are the only body that can arrest anybody. A mental health worker cannot do that. And sometimes, particularly in domestic violence, but a lot of other situations, you, the police, have the constitutional authority to arrest people and get them out of a situation which is as dangerous perhaps to them often as they are being dangerous to others. And so without, I mean, that's why I was really concerned with the defund the police movement. And that's why I went down and that's when I first met you, I think, or, or I've met you before, of course, but anyway. So could you comment on that, about this power to arrest? Well, I, I don't have much comment on it. You put it extremely well and succinctly and accurately. Police do have the power to arrest. There are other people who can use, uh, who can compel people in certain situations. Cool. Doctors and nurses can compel people and even use force to restrain people or, or give medicine in a hospital scenario. But in, in the public, no one else can do that but police. And it is not the result police want to have to use force. But it is always there as a possibility because at some point in, in certain situations, there will come a place where a person says, I'm not going to do that. Um, and as a result, uh, you have somebody saying that they are, uh, you know, I'm not going to do this. You can't make me. And uh, at, a, at a certain point, police do make. And they have to have that power to make uh, in certain situations, not for minor things, but for things instances in which people's safety is at risk or where, where the public's safety is at risk. There is a, an effort to, you have to ask and then you tell and then you make. And the making part is very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for people to see. It's uncomfortable for people to accept. There are those who refuse to accept that it's ever necessary. There really? are those who say that that, that, that is something that we just do not need ever. And we never need to go there. I am certainly willing to explore that possibility. I would love it if that were true, but I don't believe that it is. I don't believe that that is a, a realistic way to look at the world. And when we say what the world is, it doesn't mean we want to say that that's what the world should be. We don't right. want to say that that's what the world is, that's the best picture of the world, or that's the way it ought to be. But instead, we say that it is a, a reality as we know it now. And as we know it now, there are people who who will not do what they are asked and who put other people at risk, sometimes out of mental illness, sometimes out of uh, peak, sometimes out of uh, just a sense of, of, of being oblivious to what other people are doing or caring about other people, and sometimes out of a, a downright desire to hurt others. There are those among us who have that desire. So, I mean, uh, yes, even police in the are George ultimately George Floyd case, yeah. take George Floyd. Those police officers probably should have been arrested, correct? Well, ultimately they were, uh, right. yeah. and, and now yeah. all all four have actually had convictions uh, raised. No, and one of them, they all got life sentences, or was it just? I don't believe any of them got a life sentence. I, I believe that that Derek Chauvin, who was responsible right. for Mr. Floyd's murder, uh, got a sentence in in the twenty year range. But I, I don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. But in, in other words, if there had been other police officers there, they may have arrested him rather than letting that, when he goes on that guy's neck for so long, right? I mean, they, well, there were other police officers there, right, and those they, officers they have, now just, been, have now been convicted for not right. doing exactly. that, what right. you're describing. Exactly. And that exactly. is certainly going to send ripples through, uh, through the profession. What was, what was shocking to me about the defund the police was the lack of understanding really on the part of those who want to, to diminish the numbers of police in the city of that very role that the police are the only ones with the constitutional authority to arrest people. That, that was quite, uh, I'll put it as nicely as I can. It felt to me that those people were uninformed really a lot. But anyway, what was the result of all that? Well, so the result was a decision by the uh, by a majority of the city council, uh, and it wasn't just party lines. It was a majority of the city council uh, decided to reduce the Burlington Police Department's authorized headcount from 105 to 74. Right. Uh, we were never at 105, except for very brief moments, like snapshot moments. Most of the time, we hovered in the high 90s, around 97, 98, uh, and uh, for us to go down to 74 
was a, a real blow, a 30% blow uh, in our uh, staffing. And it was even more deleterious to our patrol capacity because we have three main capacities in the Burlington Police Department. We have patrol, which is what you see most of the time. Officers in marked cruisers wearing a uniform, right. responding to calls for service through 911. They drive around town. Maybe they pull people over. Maybe they are dealing with an intoxicated person on Church Street. Then we have our detective bureau, uh, who are detectives, uh, the way you see on TV. They uh, don't wear uniforms. They work out of this building. They follow up on more uh, extensive crimes that require investigation, mm -hmm. and follow through, and being taken to court. And then we have our airport. And our airport has to have eight officers, because it is dictated by federal law based on the number of gates at the airport. Uh -huh based on the number of flights that come in and the, well, not the number of flights, but the gates, the number of gates and the hours of operation. We have to have eight people at that airport. My detective bureau by contract with our union has to have at least 10 non-supervisory detectives. So therefore, when I shrink my department, the only thing that I can shrink is that patrol capacity and it gets smaller wow. and smaller. And so even though the overall diminishment of the department was 30%, the Patrol division has has been diminished by almost 50 percent. So now that diminishment like wasn't done by layoff; it uh -huh. was done by attrition. And so, in that respect, I, I I spent most of June 2020 in deep fear that I would be required to lay off officers, and I would have had to lay off my newest officers because that's how unions right. work: last in, first out. And those newest officers are among my most diverse officers by gender and by race. They come from a variety of backgrounds and ways of thinking. They're exactly the kinds of folks that we want to be police officers. Mm -hmm. I was really, really dreading that I would have to lay off us, uh, lay officers off. I didn't. Okay. But the attrition okay. happened a lot faster no, no. than the people who made the law thought it would. Not faster than I predicted. We kept up with the exact pace that I predicted in June and July of 2020, and we kept it pretty darn close, unfortunately. To the point where we are now at, I believe, 60, I have 60 effective officers. I have a total of 65, 60. but I have three officers on long-term military, one officer on long-term injury, and one officer at the academy. Actually, not that's not true anymore. He's back. So he's actually, he just graduated the police academy, my first brand new officer in nearly two years, graduated this past weekend, and is now on his first, very first day of patrol today. He's not an effective officer technically because he can't patrol by himself. He has to always be with a field training officer. So those two officers really only count as one. I have 60 effective officers. Down from what? What was the Down from 96 to 97. Well, so how are you doing exactly? Well, it's it's tough. We have uh, you know, we're we're fortunate right now. It's winter time. Things are are knock on wood, things are a little slow. Uh, and therefore, we are able to sort of keep up with what's in front of us, but it is more difficult. I'm burning through far more overtime than I ever have, mm -hmm. uh, or that the department has in, in living memory. We are, uh, we had to implement something that I created called the priority response plan, which meant that certain times we are not able to respond to every call for service. And we have to yeah. put some calls for service aside. And we also implemented something that I created called the uh, public safety continuity plan which was the, in order to make up for those uh, departing officers, we created additional resources. One that we'd had before, we used to have two community service officers. Those are unarmed, unsworn officers who can go to certain kinds of quality of life calls. As you point out, uh, Sandy, they do not have arrest powers. They cannot arrest. They cannot take people into custody. They can't use force. But that is what parts yeah. of our community said they wanted. And they don't have, they don't, they're not armed then, I guess. They're not armed. But they carry, they can carry pepper spray and they can use weapons against animals because they are animal control officers and they can work at times to, to do that, but they can't use force against people. I, we used to have two, we now have eight. So I drastically increased that position in order to be able to address some of those kinds of calls for service, quality of life kinds of calls for service that we weren't able to use officers for anymore because we have too few officers. I also created, uh, completely created, that was an existing position, the CSO or community service officer. I created a different position, the community support liaison or CSL. This is a mental health position, a social worker who's got expertise in chronic mental health issues, in substance use disorder, in houselessness, and the attendant uh, concerns that surround uh, that. 
And I have three of them plus a supervisor, so four. And they are incredibly valuable. I'm very proud of having created that role, working hand in hand with the supervisor, Lacey Smith, uh, and, and getting them into a place where they are excellent follow through on calls for service. An officer will go to a call, that officer will address the call. She will talk to the people. Maybe it was a domestic dispute, not a domestic violence situation, right. but a domestic dispute or an argument between neighbors. And that officer will stop the situation, intercede and intervene in a way that, that establishes safety and security for everyone. And then say, well, I don't know what else to do. There's not a lot that I can do as an officer. And off goes an email. And the next day when the CSLs come in, they have a stack of emails waiting for them asking, can you help us with this? Can you uh, make sure that you know we can connect these people with services that they need, uh, job services or uh, counseling services or services around, for example, substance use disorder? Right. So let's let's. So how is it? How's everything working out? And then I think we should uh, open up to some of the questions that these uh, people who have joined us might have. Sure. Uh, how are how? I mean, you just um, you were not appointed as chief, correct? But you that, I was I was appointed but unapproved. Right. Okay. But you have decided to stay. I take it. I have. I am here. I I love this city. I have a home that my wife and I love. Our kids love. My my parents live here. I I don't want to leave. Okay. So you have decided to stay, right? Through whatever, I guess. I will um, stay so and, long as I have the mayor's confidence. Um. Okay. That was, however, a quite a political battle also that you went through, right? It was, it, it was a, uh, I think it was, it was a long night at the city council. Okay. And the, but you regard that because it was a tie, correct? Basically in the end, it was tied. It was a tie and it was right so, down party lines. Right. And so when I saw that vote, I thought, well, that was a good thing given the contention over the summer given all the at least perceived problems that were occurring in other cities with the police i thought i was happy to see that there was a tie but i was more happy to see that you were staying so what do you see therefore in the future but i wanted to also talk about whether or not there is truth to the notion that crime rates are rising all over the country but sure. anyway, you have decided to stay, correct? Yes. Okay, yes. so does anybody at this moment have questions for Chief Murad? No, I guess. Okay, so let me let me then ask Chief, what is going on in Burlington in terms of crime? Because I pick up the paper every day in a market right across from City Market. So, and I've noticed there's a big parking lot right there, if you know the place I'm talking about. Yes. And I've seen open fist fights in that parking lot in the middle of Saturday afternoon. So I go in and check every morning, what happened last night, so forth. Is there uh, truth to the fact that crime is rising or, or what can you come, what can you say about that? So I, I can say this definitively, the perception of crime, the sense of, of a lack of safety has absolutely risen. People do not feel as safe in the Queen City right now. And that is not a good thing. I can also say this, that our incident volume has uh, inarguably decreased. decreased. The overall number of incidents, but incidents aren't crimes. Right. Overall incidents have decreased drastically over the past so, so six describe, years. What's an incident? What would you describe as an incident? So uh, incidents are what are tracked by our Valcor system, which is when you call 911, you get a dispatcher, and that dispatcher categorizes your call as something. Uh, we have, for example, uh, calls at the airport. We have something called an airport duress alarm. And that's when a person at an airport gate clicks a little button that says there's an obstreperous passenger and I need the airport police. Uh, we have motor vehicle complaints, which are maybe a loud vehicle or a vehicle that's parked improperly. We have embezzlement. Now that's a rare one, not one we see. Embezzlement? Things we see most often are uh, issues around the, the most common call for service is called a suspicious event because whatever it is has made a person want to call 911 for assistance and help but they don't really know what it is and the dispatcher can't really tell what it is either and they dispatch it as a suspicious event the officer goes to the scene and then says this wasn't a suspicious event this was a domestic disturbance this was a, an assault this was a robbery this was a uh, a violation of a restraining order 
this was a uh, an untimely death. There was a foul odor and somebody called that a suspicious event or they hadn't seen somebody in quite some time. And we go and we find instead that it's a it's a, an untimely death. These are all the kinds of calls that we have. Uh, and they're, they're burglaries. They are uh, crashes with fatality or with injury or with no uh, injury. They are search warrants. They are runaways. They are robberies. They are fireworks. They're noise complaints. They're intoxication complaints, graffiti removal complaints. All of these are examples. There are 130 categories of calls for service. And those calls for service have been dropping over the past several years. Now, half of the decrease from 2016 through 2019 actually came about because we, as a police department, actively stopped doing traffic enforcement. We drastically reduced, yeah. not stopped, we drastically reduced by about 80% over those several years, the number of traffic stops we did. And a part of that was to get a racial balance. Huh. We had issues in racial disparity with traffic stops, and we no longer do. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so can I ask you something? So you, sure. you are saying then consciously that, are you saying, I guess I should ask the question, that more Black people are stopped for traffic stuff than, I mean, proportionately, than white the, people? The data was clear. That, uh, that the, the data was clear. There was a disproportionate number of stops of black drivers based on their population in the driving population. Mm -hmm. and the best way to measure their population of the driving population is through crash data. Nobody crashes more than anyone else. Everybody crashes the same. And so uh, a crash data gives us a good picture of what the driving population is, which is different than the census data. We were stopping people of color more often than white people represent uh, proportionally to their presence in the driving population. And that was true That's here. no longer the case. Okay. In 2021, we reversed it. We actually do not have traffic disparities any longer. We did zero searches of black drivers in 2021. This is all preliminary data. We're going to be releasing a much more extant and, uh, and developed uh, public report, an annual report on a number of different categories around traffic, around arrests, around use of force. That will be released in April or May. So this is preliminary data. And it, it might change. Maybe I'll find one search of a Black driver in the year, but I don't think I will. We had zero searches of Black drivers, and we stopped Black drivers at a lower rate than their presence in the driving population, as measured by crash data. And we ticketed Black drivers at an even lower rate than that. Huh. We issue about, we only issue tickets in 20% of instances. We issue warnings 80% of the time. But we issue warnings even more often to Black drivers than to other drivers. That's a reversal that came about this year, and it's driven in part by driving down the number of overall traffic stops. So those decre that decrease in traffic stops, that 80% decrease, accounted for about 50% of the total decrease in incident volume mm -hmm. from 2016 through 2019. What is the other 50%? Some of it is a decrease in foot patrols, other proactive measures that officers take, and some of it is a decrease in people calling. People are not calling as often. How but come? what they are calling about is what we call priority one calls, the most serious kinds of calls. High priority calls like arsons, like assaults, like domestic violence, like lewd and lascivious conduct. Priority one calls were higher in 2021 than they had been since 2016. A mm -hmm. tremendous increase, in fact. And so that increase uh, really gave us pause. And is if we see it, if we see it continuing into 2022, and so far we do, very early in the year, but the data says that we are just as high this year for priority ones as we were last year. That's a bad thing. Yeah. It is a bad thing because not only is the priority one volume the same as last year, which is higher than any of the previous years, but we're doing it with many, many fewer officers. Okay. Hold on. There is a question from, sure. Ru from Ruby uh, asking, why shouldn't there be a civilian review board? Um, and apparently that had been a suggestion at one time, and I, I guess it has not happened. A civilian review board that I guess would replace or be working alongside of the police commission, but the civilian review board made up of civilians appointed, I don't know how, or elected. But anyway, maybe you could answer that. Or what is your opinion about that? Sure, I think a, a lot of those questions that you just brought up are part of the issue. What would it be? How would it function? What would it do? My, I think that the police commission that we have is a terrific uh, structure. What we have is an advisory and appellate body. The police commission is an advisory body that meets with me monthly. 
and uh, in the past has been an incredibly collaborative body that has been able to give additional insight to the decisions that are made at the police department. They have uh, control over, uh, they, they, have to they have the final authority over directives that they have to approve directives that we write, that is our policy. Uh, and they have insight into what the police do, including insight into discipline. And they discuss disciplinary issues and weigh in on disciplinary issues. And then they are also an appellate body that if an officer gets a disciplinary outcome that that officer does not like, the officer can go to the police commission for a final ruling that can actually override the decision made by the chief. But in all other instances, it is the chief's determination that determines discipline and ultimately determines the day-to-day -day operations of the department. That is by uh, that is by charter, and that's how it's wait, defined wait, in the charter. The, is that by the city charter? Is that what you're the talking city about? charter, which is a state law, because it has to be approved at the legislative level in Montpelier. And my rationale for retaining disciplinary authority as a chief of police is this. Our police commission has been remarkably engaged recently. They have gone on ride-alongs, many. Uh, two police commissioners in particular have gone on uh, several ride-alongs, but all of the police, most of the police commissioners have been on ride-alongs. They have also done uh, several hours, about 10 hours of training with a group called NACOL. And that is great. It is great to have that kind of engagement and to have people who want to understand what it is that they are providing advice and insight on. At the same time, that officer that I mentioned, who was our first new hire in almost two years, who just graduated the police academy, he had more than 800 hours of instruction at the police academy. He's going to have another 450 hours of field training if he makes it through, and it could be extended if he doesn't do as well as he needs to do. He then will be a police officer only after all of that. I would never in a million years put that officer in charge of discipline over other officers. A brand new officer with 800 hours of police academy experience and 450 hours of field training does not know what it is to make decisions in the heat of a moment, to actually know all the directives and the policies and the things, the vagaries of real life that can weigh in on those moments as yeah, well. Okay. I guess I, can, I would love to ask, um, maybe the person who just asked that question, what is what is the mean? What is a civilian review board exactly? That and did the city have something specific in mind when they were considering a civilian review board? Who would appoint the members? Would they be elected? What was that proposal? If anybody knows, does anybody? Do you, Chief? Well, I mean, I know that that was a proposal, correct? There, there was a proposal. I believe that it was primarily authored by Councillor Freeman. Um, it was, it was ultimately vetoed by the mayor. But what was it? What was? Well, how different was it than the police commission? I know that the police commission is appointed by the city council. Aren't the members of the police commission in kind of a bargaining session? Usually every June, the police commission is appointed by city council. So I, I believe that's, I know that they are appointed by the council. I'm not entirely certain of the mechanism for it, but I think yes. that's the way it was. Um, but I don't know what the proposal, somehow there was also the proposal for a civilian review board, which has occurred in other cities. I just didn't know much about that proposal and how it would differ. Are you, was it suggested that they would have disciplinary Yes. Authority so the, 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 one, the one that was proposed here would have disciplinary authority, which the others that you mentioned in other cities generally do not. Very, very few of those have. In fact, the only one I can think of off the top of my head that has full disciplinary authority is in Los Angeles, and it's a much different kind of police commission. But um, the, uh, the, the proposal, to my recollection, was that it would be, I don't remember the mechanism for appointing or, or electing people, I do know that there were very distinct uh, requirements for who was a part of it, that the makeup uh -huh. of the body was very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, people with lived experience uh, as, as people who had been imprisoned, people who had been uh, who had, had mental health issues, uh, people who perhaps had experienced homelessness or houselessness. Uh, and all of those were, were components of the body. Um, but I don't recall enough of it specifically. And you don't know uh, if it was a proposal, whether they were elected or appointed. Is that right? I don't. I don't recall that. Okay. And I guess I'm asking the question of the people who might be on our our Zoom. Does anybody know 
Um, but anyway, does anyone know how that proposal would have worked? However, it was ultimately it was not accepted. Is that correct, Chief? Ultimately, it was it was that was vetoed by the mayor. Okay, so let me ask you another question. So you're saying then that you, the chief, have ultimate disciplinary power over your officers? Is that correct? Not entirely. I have to pass every single thing by, I, I, I pass every use of force, I report to the mayor. I also report it publicly. Every single use of force is reported to the public on a monthly basis. You can no, find it online. Them. We have, I have an, I have created what I believe is one of the most, one of the best transparency portals of any police department in the country. If you go to the uh, burlingtonvt.gov page for the police department, there's a, a page of transparency and data that includes that annual report that I mentioned, uh, that is a deep dive into the statistics. There's a daily police blotter that would be able to oftentimes find that fight that you talked about in the parking lot. You see a fight in the parking lot, and the next day you can find it in the blotter. Regular press releases that we make, uh, data information, excuse me, about our Citizen Academy, which is a way for any person to come and, and sort of get an experience of the police department. An open data dashboard, which is actually nearly real-time data on all of our calls for service and different ways to, to sort those calls. So you can see violent crime or property crime. You can see it by area of the city. There is an open data portal, which is different from the open data dashboard, but has a lot of the same kinds of data just mixed in different ways. Again, publicly report all of those uses of force. I have just put up an ad for a redaction specialist. If anybody here knows a young person or, or any person- What is a redaction specialist? If anybody here knows people who are, are good with, with, uh, with video Computer. editing, we yeah. need a, a redaction specialist. That is a person who would not edit. We do not edit our video in a way that changes the subjective uh, ideas of it or the subjective sort of concept of the video, but we do redact it, which means putting a film over people's faces and blurring out certain images or certain words uh, in order to comply with Vermont's yeah. privacy laws. But once I get that redaction specialist, it's a funded position. I am seeking to hire it. I intend to make almost every single use of force public on body camera as well as the narratives that we have. Those narratives are breakdowns of the incident, a description of the incident, a description of the person who was the subject of the incident, including his or her race, a description of the officers who, who were the uh, involved in the incident. And that is uh, incredibly transparent. When I add to that the video, people will be able to see for themselves what officers do what it is that they're up against, how they're comporting themselves, whether they feel there are problems with that comportment or whether they feel there's problems with the behavior that the officers are dealing with, because that's what it normally is. It is, it is behavior that all of us find egregious and unlawful and unsafe that causes officers to have to use force. Okay. Um, um, we I have also another question. Reports. We have sure. another question from Jane who asks, what's your status now? Is this, and is the mayor and the city council doing a search for someone for a permanent chief. And that, those are the two questions. And uh, I guess, are you staying around? So uh, as I said, I'm, I'm the chief as long as I have the mayor's confidence. And that is essentially what he has said as well. I do not believe he intends to do another police chief search. I think that uh, I am the, the chief as long as I continue to perform as I have for the past two years during the single greatest crisis this police department has faced. In, in the last 150 years of its history. Uh, this, is, this, is, this defunding and, and the di diminishment of headcount is the biggest crisis we've faced, uh, certainly in living memory. And I'm hopeful that I've been able to, to basically guide the department in a way that has rendered it continuing to be effective in a very, very stressful uh, situation. As long as I continue to have the mayor's uh, confidence, I believe that I will continue to be the acting police chief. No, I'm sorry. Something was weird. It's weird. Something doesn't make sense. That 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 if the city council voted you down, I mean, they they would have had there. There should be some action that they have to um that that that, that they have to try and find a replacement. That there has to be. Um, it can't just be. I mean, it's it's. I mean, this is this is this is this is being in 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 lim in limb in in limbo essentially. And what did and there and there's no. There was no, uh, it, the onus was not put on city council to, 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 to suggest another person in any way, or to, or to, or to, or to, or to start, or to start their own search. So some, and you know, and that that's what I'm. 
confused. And, or are they waiting for the, for the, for the new count for the for for a new council and, and taking another and taking another vote? Um, uh, John, you can answer that, but but Jane, I don't think that the chief was. Uh, I mean, it was a tie vote. It wasn't really. Um, it it wasn't really as uh, definitive as perhaps the city council wanted. It was a tie vote, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this I'm is not, the age I'm, we live in. Uh, when know. when when President Biden puts forward Judge Jackson, he is going to maybe get. Uh, I doubt you know, it. I doubt it. And and that's that's where we are right now. Yeah. We're in a place where yeah. where these kinds of votes. These down the line votes are are more and more common. Uh, whereas you know you can look and see that, for example, uh, you know Judge Kagan was I think approved with, with I think there were only four nay votes for Judge Kagan. Um, it was a very different kind of dynamic, uh, even as recently as as her appointment. So uh, yes, I think that we had uh, we had a six six. That's not a vote down as much as it's right. not an approval. Right. Um, but it is it's one okay. that. Uh, we have to have a chief of police. I'm still the chief of police. It's up to the mayor to put forward a new chief of police if he so desires. And for the time being, he's not going to do that as long as I retain his confidence. Right. I wonder, understood. Sorry. So, so Todd vote was just like saying it, it didn't change anything. Huh? Right. Okay. Right. It didn't, it didn't definitively change anything. Right. Um, anybody else have any questions um, or discussion or comments that they would like to make? Okay, so um, John, what do you you say that you know number one priority are serious crimes? Correct? Is that what you're saying? Uh, in 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 our priority response plan, priority one crimes uh, or priority one calls rather are high priorities. And they're not all crimes. For example, uh, there is a, a roadway hazard is a priority one call. What priority one means is that if an officer is available, an officer is always <clears throat> going to go, even if there's only one officer available. Uh, and a roadway hazard is something that's important. A down tree needs somebody to take care of that, but it's not a crime. However, priority ones track much more closely with crime than priority threes. Priority threes are calls that are not life safety. And, they're, and if we don't have enough officers available, we won't go to those. I need to have at least two officers available for most priority one responses. You need to send at least two officers to a domestic violence yeah, situation. Yeah. At least why two is officers. that? Because it's a dangerous situation. Correct. Right. Right. And so you want at least two. And therefore, I will keep two in reserve. If I get to the point where I have two officers available for calls and a priority three comes in, no one is going to that call. Because these two officers have to, be, have to wait in case a priority one comes. Because when that priority one comes, then they will go to it. And then I won't have any officers available for right. anything. Right. Right. And then I'll have to wait till officers become available again. But when a priority three happens and you've got one officer available or even two officers available, that priority three is, is what we call stacked. It's held until, until we have more officers than two available to answer it. Okay. Thank you. We're getting close. I wanted to ask one final one question, but does anyone else have any questions or thoughts? I think Andy has his hand up. Okay, I don't see it. Good, Good. Andy. Um, so, hi, John. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. I have to move. Uh, the, 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 I guess I just want to follow up on the Citizen Review Board question because, um, uh, you know, the CNA report, and I, don't, I haven't heard you. I didn't hear the whole show tonight, so I didn't hear you talk about that. But the CNA report did recommend a Citizen Review Board. What's the CNA? And first CNA of all? Is, a, is a consultant that oh. was hired by the city to write, uh, to do oh, a, right, recommendations right. for the police department. Right. And they wrote a, a fairly lengthy report, um, uh, I think 168 pages or something like that. And um, one, they made many recommendations. And one of their recommendations was that there be a citizen review board that um, uh, had the uh, uh, authority to examine internal and external investigations. And it said, this chief should no longer serve as the final authority on facts and discipline. Now, there, John, I just think there must be uh, another criteria for being able to, for citizens or residents to be able to um, make a judgment about um, 
uh, incidents in the police besides having 1,200 hours of lived experience as a police officer, because the very reason why you have a citizen review board is because if it's just police always reviewing police, then you, you have a potential problem there, it, whether it's in Minneapolis or in, um, in Burlington. Sure. Um, and and I, I don't mean not to be making eye contact with the camera. I'm actually looking through the report right now. What the report said is, is actually that, that uh, it didn't determine that uh, there should be uh, a change in that. It said that it, is, uh, it, it wasn't definitive about whether or not the chief retained that kind of uh, authority uh, over discipline. I would, I would point out that a good portion of the original document, uh, which was leaked to the press and leaked uh, online, uh, actually didn't talk about Burlington, Vermont. It talked about Burlington, North Carolina when it talked about the discipline section. It talked about a civilian, uh, a structure that was unique to Burlington, North Carolina. Um, it said the finding was that presently the Burlington police chief has ultimate authority to accept or reject the police commission's recommendations. And it's critically important there's a structure that gives greater authority rather than the ability to advise to the commission regarding the final disposition. That's actually already in place because there is a review mechanism that goes to the mayor and then also goes to that I have to actually justify any, uh, any, devi any, any deviation from, from their recommendation. Um, I mean, who do, you, who, yeah. who do you have to report that to? I report it to the police. So the police, I, I indicate a disciplinary case to the police commission. The uh -huh, police okay. commission hears it. The police commission gives me a recommendation or, or, or listens to mine and concurs with it or disagrees with it. And if they just, this is all online as well. Uh, in that same data section, uh, a document called um, the, I'm sorry, uh, the, pardon me. Um, there we go. The role of the Burlington Police Commission in reviewing complaints against BPD employees, which we adopted in August of 2020. So that was written uh, through the early part of 2020. Jen Morrison and uh, Police Commissioner Shireen Hart did a lot of work on that. It was adopted by the entirety of the Police Commission and the Burlington Police Department. And it actually outlines what C uh, in large part what CNA recommends. Um, that there is a, uh, a formal role for them to be able to accept or reject uh, the chief's re uh, determinations, and that if the chief, uh, if they reject that, the chief has to explain why he's not going with their recommendation, and they can then take that to the mayor for the mayor to actually uh, put pressure on the police chief as well. But ultimately, the charter does say what the charter says, which is the final authority is the police chiefs. A police chief that can stand up to the entirety of a police commission and a mayor uh, about a decision is going to have to be a police chief who really articulates what he or she is believing or is talking about and has to be able to do that pretty pretty clearly, or he or she is likely going to be out of a job. I think that's the kind of instance that would result in me no longer having the mayor's confidence. Okay, any other questions? Andy, any? No? No, okay. well, I think I think there could be further further discussion of this, but I, you said you were getting near the end of the show, and, and uh, I do appreciate your answer, John. Just, I just, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, um, my final question is that, as a historian, I, I have the following question. There's been a lot of um, allegations, accusations, truth to the position that the police suffer from, I guess, systemic racism. Um, what does that mean? And do you agree with that? And if you agree with that, what are you gonna do about it? So I, I think that policing absolutely has had issues of race in it uh, as a profession and historically. I think that uh, there are, are clear associations with police in the South and uh, slavery. Um, in the North, it, it more often had to do with issues around a union organization. Uh, but even there, uh, one of the first things that happened in New York City when it was still New Amsterdam was that the colonial governor uh, brought in, uh, created a police force to control the, the, the dissolution that he was seeing. Uh, and he was a relative authoritarian and wanted that dissolution dealt with, created a night watchman police force. And the second thing he did was he imported slaves to, to build the piers. Um, and so, you know, that's New York City, and that history goes back far beyond and far prior to the Declaration of Independence. 
uh, these these things have been entwined. This this unequal relationship has been intertwined since then and and before then. Really, um, there are issues. If I see racism or uh, acts of, uh, of of racial bias in my officers, I'm going to take swift and severe action on that to to the extent that I can by contract. If I see actions on it that defy our policy then I will take the steps that our policies and, and directives allow, which includes termination and for some kinds of acts. I think the issue here is that, for example, with use of force, again, there are disparities in our use of force. There are alarming disparities, real disparities between who, uh, with regard to the, the population and then the population of people who are arrested and therefore are ostensibly committing offenses, and then the population of people against whom force is used. It, the disparity grows in each one. And yet, if you go through those 150 incidents online, which you can do yourself, you read through them, you see what they are. And again, I'm going to make the video of them available as well. I have not been able to find instances in which there are acts that are bias in those moments. Bias exists in all of our hearts, in everyone's hearts. But the overt action that's caused by that bias is not apparent to me as I review those. And I invite anyone to review those, which is why I make all of them public. If it is not the officer who is creating the use of force or the need for it because of his or her bias, then instead we are talking about differences uh, that are often the result of the very systemic racism that all of us decry, that are upstream influences, issues around, uh, around access to, to education or to right. economy or to uh, health or, or to jobs, all of these things where we know we have pronounced disparities. Those okay. have results downstream, and the police officer is the person encountering the downstream results. Okay, I think Ruby, did you have a last uh, a comment? I believe that uh, there was a comment uh, arguing that we are all impacted by racism, and I believe I don't know uh, that was yes, uh, yeah, I Ruby, Ruby, I, I did. Yes, and I think that's what we're, we have, we can learn from James Baldwin. It's what he's been trying to tell us all of these years is that we are as a society impacted by racism and the work that we do against racism will be for the benefit of all people. Mm -hmm. All right, if any other final comment, Jane has something, Jane? Yeah, um, I, um, we've, my my i guess i have had contact with co contact with the police my family has, has had has had in the past it hasn't always been very pleasant some of and some of the problems with the with with racism can get, i mean there is also m might reflect some some other some 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 other some other problems as 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 well um um my i mean the, the, I, I remember when I went, when I was in a when 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 I when I was in a traffic accident. They weren't necessarily. I mean, it depends upon the police department. Some people treat treat or you 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 get a little treated a little a little bit better better than others. Uh, I mean, some police departments are, are, are better. South Burlington doesn't have the greatest rep, doesn't have the best reputation. I think Burlington probably does, um, and. Um, if you, how do you find out? I mean, if you report a crime, um, how do you how do you track what happens after what 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 happens after what what happens to that to that? I mean, I mean, because you don't necessarily um, you might report an incident. I mean, which I mean, because I had to report an incident twice, and it wasn't, you know, it didn't rise to the level of, I mean, of 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 of, dang, of danger, but it was more like more like harassment. Um, what what happened? I mean, how do you track um, how do you track that? What what ha what happens as a result when I you think, report? I I think that's one of the that's key, Jane, to ask because what I have found working all, all of my life is how few people know how to deal with the judicial system in any way, how to deal with the law, how to understand the law, and that is frankly why I want to 
continue this project at the People's Law School. People need to know their rights. They need to know what the law is, how to deal with the courts, how if you're a victim of a crime, exactly like you said, how come nothing is being done about that crime? And people mm -hmm. simply don't understand the law. And I don't think there's much education about it. And we really, I think, need to do a better job about that. I don't know if you, I mean, to me, if you came to me, Jane, and said, how do I follow what happens to that crime? I'd call the state's attorney's office. However, they're so overwhelmed. But also, I'll tell you something. Most people don't know the difference between the state's attorney and a public defender in the first place. But I would say call the state's attorney and see if you can find out where your case is. But they're so overwhelmed usually that they probably don't even know themselves in, at any given moment. But I don't know. What do you you say, Chief, about so, that? Uh, on, on the website, there's a page called Crisis Advocacy Intervention Programs, or CAIP, C-A-I-P, CAIP. And uh, it includes those community support liaisons I talked about. Those would be excellent people to, to help someone who's either been the victim of or the reporter of a crime and wants to have a little follow through. Uh, we have a victim's advocate. We have a victim service specialist who is embedded in the police department through CEDO. Uh, or the, the, uh, the, the Community and Economic Development Office, which is another part of city government. Right. We have a domestic violence prevention officer and a domestic violence advocate for people who have been involved in domestic violence or is that, relationships. Is that still Mary McAllister? It is still Mary McAllister. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I think the world of Mary McAllister. And so uh, do I. So do I. That domestic violence prevention officer is a, is a position I've had to really work hard to keep it because in keeping that position, I'm denying the patrol a body. And it is the only specialized position that I've kept is the, the DVPO. And that's because the DVPO is so important. When, you know, your question was phrased a little, I wasn't entirely clear if you were talking about reporting a crime that you've witnessed, you may not have all the rights to, to understand what happens at the end right, of that. Right. But you can always make a freedom <laughs> of information request and you can get what is by law shareable. If you are the victim of a crime, however, you absolutely should have follow through. You right. should have follow through from our team at the CAPE office, and you should have follow through from the state's attorney's office if they it take that crime. That, it, it, was, it wasn't that serious. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was grabbed at and and um and described and um around the Howard Center at night when I when I and and it wasn't a wise thing to be walking. I mean, anyways, and anyways, it wasn't. It, but, that's not unserious. It, it, that's that's exactly the kind of thing that contributes that's to a sense to know, of unsafety. To know, what ha to know what happened. I mean, whether to 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 whether they to to what kind of follow through was 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 done because I haven't seen <clears throat> haven't seen the man haven't seen the man who grabbed at me since. So I would be interesting to know what had not to know what had happened had 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 happened. I mean, I mean, and that may just best be just a coincidence. I might say that um, if any, you know, I am kind of committed to at least giving people any kind of referral that I know about. So, for you know, anybody can call me at any time. I and I mean that. Okay, so um, for all this, but so I get, apparently so is the chief very available. So with that, I think we probably should close for the night and thank those who are with us, particularly the chief, uh, John Murad, and maybe we'll get another report from him next semester. But thank you all for being here. Next week, we're going to present Jane Nodell, a, pro a professor from UVM, who's going to talk about inflation and, and about the state of our economy, which I'm sure everybody is feeling Very a few cool. pinches. So thank you all for being here and hope to see you next week.